Jeff told me to tell you that uh, if you would take your uh, song books and turn to song number 71, that will be our closing song. So if you do that, I'd appreciate it. Our next topic is domestic violence. And Brother John West is going to be bringing us a lesson on this topic, which unfortunately is a, a, a plague in our nation today. John, of course, as most of you know, is married to uh, the former Sonia Caudill. He's talking about a, a help suitable <laughs> for him. Uh, she is actually, I found she's a help suitable for all of us. Uh, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm, I got spoiled. Um, they have three children, Lauren, Jonathan, and Joshua, which I'm sure all, uh, most of you have met or know. John graduated from the Memphis School of Preaching in 89, Faulkner in 91, Fried Hardeman in 2000, and the Police Academy in 2011. And he works today uh, at the Montgomery County, uh, Texas Sheriff's Office, but more importantly, he is a uh, preacher for the Dayton uh, Church of Christ in Dayton, Texas. And we appreciate and love John and his family so much. John, come and bring us a good lesson, will you? Thank you, Jack. The lesson that has been assigned to me, domestic violence, is one that is a very sensitive subject. But how, however, it is one that we have to address. Many people, including Christians, have been victims of domestic violence. And some continue to be. And... Because of this, it brings a lot of pain, not only to, to family, but it can bring some problems within the congregation when such is known. Since this, this is a very sensitive subject, and we're going to handle this with as much care as possible for those who have been affected, at the same time speaking the truth and love about this situation. When David assigned me this topic, I told him, thank you, not because this is something I would like to deal with, but because the past three years being in law enforcement, this is a subject or an area in which I've dealt probably more with than anything else. You might be surprised at the number of cases of domestic violence that occurs uh, not only in our nation and the world, but here in our area. It is something that occurs every day. And because it does, it is something that we have to address. So many times we've looked at this as a private issue among families that we don't want to speak about. We don't want to get involved. We might hear neighbors arguing or fighting, and we say, oh, I don't want to get involved in that. that. That's none of my business. But we live in a time where we can't hide our head in the sand, nor can we turn a blind eye to things that are going on. I think in just the last few years in law enforcement, I have had several calls where it would be a neighbor call or maybe a family member who lives next door or maybe someone within that household involved in a domestic situation reached out to a friend or a family member and said, this is going on right now when we were called. And more times than I can count when I actually pulled up to the residence and made contact with all the parties involved, they would say, nothing's happening. We don't know why you were called. But obvious signs of bruising, scratches, blood, hair in a mess. And I know that's not always a case of domestic violence. Some people are just like that at home. But in these instances, it, that's what it was. So we know that there are... There are a lot of things happening that people try to keep private. But we're going to look at some things today, particularly some examples where it should help us to see as Christians that we can't stay private or quiet about this any longer. Domestic violence is a very ser serious issue that's plaguing us today. It is this type of violence and abuse that happens in personal relationships. That's why it's called domestic violence. I will say in the state of Texas, we don't refer to it typically as, as uh, domestic violence, and you're going to see why just in a moment. It's referred to as family violence. So when we go to a situation, we don't say we're here on a domestic violence situation. We're, 
We're sometimes called, and when it comes across on the computer, it comes across as a family violence, not domestic violence, because that's the way it's termed in Texas. And as I said, you'll see why just in a moment. It does happen in a personal relationship. It also affects men and women of every ethnic group, race, religion, heterosexuals, homosexuals, both rich and poor, teens, adult, and elderly. I will say I've been to multi-million dollar mansions for these very issues, down to homes where the walls were falling in and holes were in the floor. It doesn't matter one's social status in life. It affects everyone. I've been to both heterosexuals, husbands and wives, as well as having to deal with homosexuals in the same situation. And I know we had a couple of great lessons today about marriage, and we know that God does not recognize the heterosexuals as a married couple. However, in the state of Texas, again, as you're going to see in some definitions I'll put in a moment, why it's referred to even as family violence in those situations. I've seen it involving teens, where it may be brothers or sisters physically fighting. Folks, we know that happens a lot. But the times we've been called, it had escalated to the point where bones were being broken, blood was being let, and parents could not get a stop or put a stop to that, at least without causing further problems. I've seen it with elderly, where grand grandchildren have attacked the grandparents. Those are still family violence situations. Or children have attacked their parents. I've actually arrested juveniles before for attacking their parents and abusing them. So these, these things happen in all walks of life. We're going to find out, though, that most victims are women. It's not always women. I have arrested women for abusing their husbands. But in most cases, it is the woman that is abused. One in four women will be the victim of domestic violence at some point in her life. Domestic violence is a pattern of controlling behaviors. Now, I want you to think about this. It is a pattern of controlling behaviors, some of which in many times are criminal. That include, but is not limited to, physical assaults. That's what we always think about is physical assaults. But it could be emotional assault. Sexual assault, isolation. I'll talk about that a little bit later on, but some are isolated from friends and family. It could be economic coercion, where maybe a husband takes his wife's paycheck and says, you'll get what I give you. Or the wife may take the husband's check. I've actually dealt with that before. I'll give you so many dollars this week, and if you spend that tough, that's all you got. The rest I take care of, I deal with. You have nothing to do with it. And then it goes into physical confrontations very often after that. So we see all of these sorts of things happening. Threats, stalking, intimidation. These are signs of domestic violence. But let's look at some definitions. I'm going to give you some definitions from the Texas Criminal and Traffic Law Manual of 2013 and 2014, which is the most current at this time. In the Texas Family Code, Section 71.003 of the Family Code, family is defined as individuals related by consanguity or affinity as determined by under Section 573.022 and 573.024 of the Texas Government Code. Individuals who are former spouses of each other, individuals who are parents of the same child whether or without regard to marriage, and a foster child and foster parent without regard to whether those individuals reside together. In the state of Texas, this makes up a family. Husbands and wives, uh, and husbands and wives with children. It may be a man and a woman having a children together, but they're no longer together. Some people refer to that today as baby daddy or baby mama, but they're no longer together, or they have never been together, but they have a child together. And maybe a situation occurs between that man and woman. They have a child together. They may not be living under the same household, but under the state of Texas law, that is considered a family, because they have that family with that child. Let's go further. 
What's a household? Oh, we're thinking about the household is the family, the family unit. Well, it, it somewhat is, but it goes beyond what we think. Household, as defined in the state of Texas, Family Code 71.005, is a unit composed of persons living together in the same dwelling without regard to whether they're related to one another. Now, how will that come into play? Roommates? You, know, you might have a roommate living with you. Single people do that from time to time. It might be a boarder. They're renting a room out to someone. That's still a household. You're living under the same roof. And when a situation of violence occurs with one living under the same roof, in the state of Texas, it's still termed family violence. Because you're living under the same roof in the same household. So that is a domestic violence situation. So whether we refer to it as family violence, as does the state of Texas, or just simply domestic violence, we see these definitions fit very well. Now let's look at a definition of family violence from the Texas Family Code, Section 71.004 of the Texas Criminal and Traffic Law Manual of 2013-14. It is defined as, and you see the number one there, I only listed the number one because this is the one we primarily want to deal with, an act by a member of a family or household against another member of the family or household that is intended to result in physical harm, bodily injury, assault, sexual assault, or that is a threat that, is re that reasonably places the member in fear of imminent physical harm, bodily injury, assault, or sexual assault, but does not include defensive measures to protect oneself. Notice that last phrase in there. This does not include defensive measures to protect oneself. Let's say a husband does attack his wife and she protects herself with a gun and shoots him. She is not charged with family violence. She protected herself. Or let's say the husband hits the wife and the bat is nearby and she swings that bat and cracks him upside his head. Then she is still the victim. However, when Ed has been, I know, involved in things like this in law enforcement and others as well, or Nathan, uh, when you get to a, a scene like this, regardless of who the aggressor is, everybody's a victim. And then it's beholden upon that officer that is on the scene to try to figure out who's telling the truth and who's lying. To make sure that if someone's going to jail, the right person goes to jail, not the victim. So it becomes somewhat difficult at times. But it still does not alleviate the fact that a call was placed to a 911 system because someone was abused in some form or fashion. Let's look at some statistics on domestic violence. Every nine seconds in the United States, a woman is assaulted or beaten. Around the world, at least one in every three women who have been beaten or coerced into sex or otherwise abused during her lifetime, most often the abuser is a member of her own family. You hear often that women who are raped, it said, the majority of the times they knew the rapist. Here's part of that reason. I don't even want to get in the number of times I've had to go and deal with the sexual assaults that were related to family issues where someone in the family sexually assaulted another member of the family. It's still a domestic violence situation, but then it ups the ante because the sexual assaults in the state of Texas bring a much higher charge than just simply a family violence situation or, as we will say, a domestic violence situation. But those things still happen very often, too often, more than we really want to think about. Studies suggest that up to 10 million children witness some form of domestic violence annually. Up to 10 million children every year witness that. That's staggering. Domestic violence occurs so often that every day in the United States, 
More than three women are murdered by their husbands or boyfriends. And again, that's another sad situation. Sonia had an aunt back in the 1970s, I believe it was, that was murdered by her husband. And this very thing we're talking about, you see it happening very often today. Because people don't respect life anymore. They don't respect their obligations in marriage anymore. And so we see this violence continue to happen. We turn the TV on and we, we hear about murders every day. We hear about shootings. We hear about stabbings. We hear about robberies. But how often do you hear about domestic situations? Occasionally. But not that often. Let's go further. Domestic violence victims lose nearly 8 million days of paid work per year in the United States alone. The equivalent of 32,000 full-time jobs. Just because domestic violence situations. Let's go further. An estimated 1.3 million women are victims of physical assault by an intimate partner each year. Now, you remember I just mentioned that we don't see very much on the news about it? Here's why. Only 25% of all physical assaults perpetrated by an intimate partner is reported to the police. One of the things when, at least in our agency, when a deputy goes to a family violence situation, one thing the state, the state of Texas law states that a report shall be generated shall be. There's no option about it. The officer doesn't have a right to say, well, you know, he just slapped you a little bit. You got some red marks, but you're not hurt that badly. We won't take a report this time. Or the family says, oh, no, we don't want this reported. We just called you to put a stop to the fighting. We're okay now. Sorry. The state of Texas requires a report to be generated to keep up with these Facts, not just for statistics' sake, but because we're dealing now with victims of violence. And part of that reporting system, at least in our agency, it is required, actually it's in the state now, it is required to find out among those involved in the situation, has this happened before? I've taken a number of calls and reports, and when I would ask, one or both parties, has this happened before? Have, have there been any other acts of family violence with you two? Sometimes they will say no. Very few times that happens. Most of the time that's, oh, yes. Particularly the victim will say, oh, a number of times I just haven't called. It just got so bad at this point today I had to call because I was in fear of my life. So now... We see what people deal with, and we see that the extent of violence in our society, and yet it goes unreported. Why does it go unreported? Because as the outset of the lesson I stated, people want to keep this private. They don't want others to know about it for embarrassment, fear of rejection, for what others might say about it, or for letting their private business be known to other people. So we see abuse continuing as a result of it. 85% of all victims of domestic violence are women. I saw some statistics that had 90, even as high as 95% are women. Females between the ages of 20 and 24 are at the greatest risk of non-fatal intimate partner violence. You remember I mentioned in this family violence definition I'd used number one, well, one under that was dating violence. It's still considered family violence because of a dating relationship that a boy and a girl have together. Dating violence still constitutes family violence. And that's what we see in these statistics. This is also staggering. Boys who witness domestic violence are two times as likely to abuse their own partners and children when they become adults. When they've been abused, they're two times as likely to abuse their family as well. Domestic violence is a leading cause of injury to women more than car accidents, muggings, and rapes combined. 
Again, that tells you to the extent we see this now in our country. One half of all homeless women and children in the United States are fleeing domestic violence situations. One half. Again, that's a staggering number. They had to get out of that situation and they had nowhere to go. So they went to the streets. Again, I've dealt with situations where in talking to, again, most of the time a wife, a woman, husband may be in handcuffs in the back of a patrol car and say, where can you go? I have nowhere to go. Because they're told, this man may be out by morning. We may not be able to keep him if he can call someone to post his bond. And if he comes and gets out, he's going to come back here. Do you have anywhere to go? Several times I've had women say, no, I have nowhere to go. What about family? I remember one instance where a woman said, no, my family said if I married him, never call them again. Now what do you do? I said, how about calling them anyway? I believe under the circumstances they would probably understand. And that woman called and the family said, sure, come over. But there are times that some have nowhere to go. And that is sad. In 70 to 80 percent of intimate partner homicides, no matter which partner was killed, the man physically abused the woman before murder. In 70 to 80 percent of these domestic homicides, they said regardless who was killed, it may be the wife protecting herself and shooting the husband to keep him from killing her. Or it may be the husband killing the wife after beating her up. It still tells us that 70, 80, 70 to 80 percent of the time, the woman was physically abused prior to that murder. Now let's look at some examples. This example happened just a week and a half ago. I saw this on uh, in an article, and I thought it'd be good to include it in this slide or in this presentation. It was the title of the article was entitled "911 Call Captures Woman's Last Breath as She's Killed by Husband." And what I have in this slide and the next slide as well, I couldn't get it all in one slide. Just excerpts from this article. A woman spent her last moments pleading for help on a 911 call before her husband gunned her down Thursday night in Granbury, Texas. That was February the 12th. As a domestic dispute escalated, Lavera Aiken, a well-known businesswoman, tried to escape her husband by retreating to her car where she called police around 10 p.m. But as she tried to leave, her husband, Tommy Dooley, blocked her car and opened fire. When the officers arrived at the home in the gated community, they found Lavera's body slumped over inside her car. Sheriff Deeds confirmed to the local media that she had been shot six times at very close range. Lavera was pronounced dead at the scene and her husband admitted to authorities that he was the one responsible for her death. The couple had only been recently married, but authorities said this was the second 911 call they received from Lavera over a domestic concern. The previous call was placed less than a month ago when Tommy had left the home before police arrived. Tommy is now charged with Lavera's murder and is being held on a $500,000 bond. Notice it said they were recently married. If you look at them, they, were, they are a middle-aged couple. I did find her Facebook page, and I did a little research and looked at some of the pictures and some of the statements on her Facebook page, and I found this picture. This actually was the picture that was in the article itself, but I found this picture on her Facebook page. And on, her, on the picture, underneath in the caption, she stated that this is a picture of me and my new husband. And it was dated November 2013. So very likely married just a little over a year. And now she's dead. This happens often in America. Remember we stated in the statistics that at least three women are killed every single day in the United States with domestic, because of domestic violence. Here's another one. Where an innocent person died. Occurred, if I'm not mistaken, February the 10th. Father charged after infant dies from injuries during domestic dispute. On Tuesday at 2 a.m., detectives responded to Akron, this is Akron, Ohio, Children's Hospital Emergency Department to investigate a report of an infant with serious head injury. Upon further investigations, detectives learned the child was struck on the head 
with a ceramic coffee mug that was thrown during a domestic dispute between the boy's mother and father. The two-month-old died as a result of that injury. Now, the father wasn't intending to kill his child. He was intending to throw it at the wife because he's mad at her. And the unintended result was the death of his own child. You know, it's sad that we see these kind of things happening. And not only do we see the victims of family violence as one who has been abused, not only murdered, but there are times less than murdered, they're abused, severely beaten. But now we're finding, and not just now, but we see where innocent bystanders are often killed. A small baby who had done nothing. Sometimes husbands and wives, uh, or whatever the situation may be, may be in a domestic violence situation and one pulls a gun to shoot the other and they shoot someone else, may shoot one of their own children, or they shoot a neighbor. How many times have we heard the murder-suicides that take place around the country where one member of the family is mad at the other member and they kill that person and then they kill the rest of the family just because they don't want those children or the rest of the family to be with anyone else. And then they take their own lives. This is, a, a, again, a very, not only sad situation, but a very real situation that plagues our country. And it is a plague, folks. It's something that is not going to go away. You can go back in the Bible. You know the first domestic violence situation that took place? Cain and Abel where Cain was jealous over his brother Abel and he rose up and slew him. Very first domestic violence situation. We read about it in the Bible. It's gone on since the first family that lived upon this earth. And it will continue until the Lord comes again. I'm going to look at some ways to help and overcome that. But this is a real thing that's happening. And as I said before, there are some people who see these things happening or they hear about them. They hear the neighbors next door and they don't want to do anything about it. They're afraid to do something about it. They're afraid that that neighbor might retaliate against them as a result of them calling. Or they just simply don't want to get involved. Folks, people's lives are at risk. Their lives are in danger. We need to get involved. When we hear things like that going on, we don't need to take the law in our own hands. But we need to call someone, namely, 911. We need to have the police out in these situations to put a stop to it. At least at that moment. Does that mean it's going to end? Maybe, maybe not. But at least at that moment, a stop's put to it and a public record is made to where law enforcement can keep an eye on that situation in the future to see if there's anything else that can be done to help. I remember a situation one night that I was called a domestic violence situation. I get there and wife is locked. The husband and wife lived in an RV park in a fifth wheel camper. The camper was locked. The husband jumped in the truck and told me he was leaving. Well, the owner of the facility blocked him in and I told him, buddy, you're not leaving. You're going to get out and talk to me. He drew his fist back to hitting me and before he could hit me, I grabbed him and pulled him out of the truck and jumped on top of him, wrestled with him for about three to four minutes before I could get him in handcuffs, and with the help of the owner of that park, we handcuffed the man and took him to my patrol car. I found out after the situation he was not only, and you can smell the alcohol, not only drunk, but he was also using cocaine at the same time. When I finally got the wife to open the door and realize that she is no longer in danger, She came out of basket case shaking and crying. They'd only been married one month. And she said this was the first time this had happened, but he'd beat her up. As in the case with every family violence situation, we take pictures. I took pictures of this woman and did not notice any obvious signs of bruising, no obvious signs of trauma to her body. But we took the report, took him to jail, And I was told by one of my supervisors, go by, because the situation that it was, go by in a few days. 
and take pictures again. Sometimes the DA encourages us to do that. Why? Because those red marks of today will turn into the bruises of tomorrow. I went back a few days later and that woman was bruised all up. It just had not shown at that particular point. Fortunately, the gentleman, if you want to call him that, pled guilty immediately to doing it and said he'd take whatever punishment they wanted to give him. And he was given a six-month sentence in jail. He was out in three. In the meantime, she said she was going to move somewhere where he couldn't find her. But this is just one situation among many where you go to these things and you find out drugs and alcohol are often involved. And matter of fact, that's another question that we have to ask when doing a report. Was drugs and or alcohol involved in this family violence? And more cases than not, it is. But now let's go further in the next ten minutes we've got left. How can we overcome problems of domestic violence today? What can we do about it? Well, we need to have, first of all, the homes that God wants us to have. Mark did an excellent job in dealing with the marriage and the family. Laid that out as plainly as it could be. You'd have to have, Mark, I think a Ph.D. to misunderstand that. Because sometimes it takes a Ph.D. to misunderstand something as plain and simple as what the Bible teaches. And Mark's touched on several verses. I'm going to touch back on those again. I knew that there would be lessons overlapping, but this is a way that we can overcome it. And I'm going to end it with some other ways. But we need to have the home as God would have it to be. From the very beginning of time, God provided marriage in the home for the good of mankind. We're not going to read Genesis 1, 26 and 27, but we know that in those verses, God or man was created in the image of God. Marriage is a God-given institution. It is one of the three divine institutions ordained by God. And it is a God-given institution that one man and one woman will be together for that one lifetime. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24 says, A man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Bruce, I think, wherever you are, did an excellent job in dealing with that one flesh. Now, when they become one in unity, in goals, in that one marriage, that one man and one woman, that marriage is to last for a lifetime, and Bruce dealt with exception in Matthew 19.9. But if we want the homes as God would have them to be, then we'd follow that divine arrangement. God placed great responsibility on the home. Why? Because the home is the very bedrock of society. Why do you think we're having so many problems today in our society? Because the home is not as it should be today. And until people get back to the Bible and make the home as it should be, our society is going to continue to crumble. The home is a very bedrock of the nation. And if the home goes, everything else goes with it. Folks, the home, as far as America is concerned, is gone. It's absolutely gone in this society. People do not care whether they're married or not. If you work in the secular field, I know you work with people who are living under the same roof sharing the same bed, who have not married one another. Back in the deep south, and you may call it this out here, but we call it shacking up, buddy. Some people just call it shacking. But people living together without following God's ordained plan of marriage, and because of such, there's little respect for the institution of marriage. And since those people are not as committed as they should be, then why do you think they're going to be committed? If they're not committed to home, why do you think they're going to be committed in society to morals or anything else? As a matter of fact, if they're living together, they are immoral. But they're not committed. 
So we need to have a home as God would have it to be. Look at the role of man in the home as a husband. He's the head of the house. Ephesians 5, 23 says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Now this does not mean because he's the head that he's a dictator or tyrant. That's why we're seeing problems in this in society today with domestic violence. Because often the husband wants to be a dictator or tyrant. It's going to be my way or the highway, some think. And they will force their opinion on others. They will force everything upon the rest of the family. A good man will lead his family, not force things upon his family. Won't have to. Because if we're following God's law as we should be, then we don't have to worry about forcing it upon others. I joke with Sonia sometimes. I'll tell her, I'm the head of this house. And she responds, and I'm the neck that turns that head. <laughs> when I think I've got something over on her, Jack, she is invaluable, but I can't get anything on her. She always has a comeback. But there has to be a head of the house. And being the head of my house, I don't go into Sonia and the kids and say, this will be done this way, this is going to be done, whether you like it or not, and nothing's going to change. Now, there are times that I have to make decisions as the head of the family. There are times that Sonia and I sit down together, and as a family we make decisions. But it doesn't mean as a head of the house I'm going to be a tyrant about those things. God's placed man on the road to provide stability. Peace and order in the home. But look further as the role as a husband. The husband is to love his wife. Verse 25 of Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. The wife is to be treated with respect and love and honor. But then let's go further. He is to be the provider of the home. 1 Timothy 5, 8 says, But if any will provide not for his own, especially those of his own house, he had denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Folks, the Bible tells men as a protector and provider of the home, you provide for your family. That provision means that you provide everything necessary for your family to sustain not only life, but as Christians to sustain their spiritual well-being. If someone breaks into my home, I'm not going to lay in the bed and say, Son, you get a gun, go take care of it. I'm the one to protect my family. And if I'll allow a man to come in or a woman or anyone else to come in and violate my family without trying to protect them, then I have violated 1 Timothy 5 8. There's a role the husband is placed in, but he also has a role as a father. He is a spiritual leader of the family. Sadly, it often falls to the mother because a lot of men won't take that responsibility. But to fulfill his task in the God-given way, he must be a Christian. That doesn't mean a man that is not a Christian cannot take care of his family. But in order to do it God's way, he must be a Christian. He needs to be strong in faith as well. The father must train and rear his children, Ephesians 6, 4. Provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. They're to be trained up in the way they should go, Proverbs 22, 6 says. And when he's old, he won't depart from it. But what about the role of the wife? The wife is to submit to the husband. Ephesians 5, 22, Wives, submit to yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord, that they may teach the younger women to be sober and to love their husbands and love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, Good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Titus chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. The role as a mother, mothers are to rear their children in love. She is to be the guide and the manager of the home. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 14, it says, I will therefore, younger women, marry, bear children, guide the home, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. But then what is the role of the children? To be obedient to parents. 
Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Children don't always like what parents tell them to do. Michael said this last night. You tell your children to do something, why? Because I said so. I always hated that. And I said, when I become an adult, I'm never going to tell my children that a single time. And I've eaten those words probably once a day. (laughs) Because I said so, that's good enough. And it ought to be at this time, because children have to learn. There are times they need to be told why. There needs to be explanation. There are times just because you said do it. You can talk to them later about it. They must also honor their parents. How can we stop domestic violence? There are so many problems in the world today, and mainly because there are so many problems in the family. The way to stop domestic violence is to work on the family and bring the family back to God and the Bible. Christians are the ones who can make the difference. Sadly, there are many in Christian families who are facing this very thing that they ought not be facing because someone in that family is not following God's Word. But if we're the family that God wants us to be, then rather than hurting one another, we're not only helping one another, but we're helping other people out as well. We must get back to serving God and working at building our families. The husbands need to be the kind of husbands. Wives need to be the kind of wives. We need to be the kind of parents, and children need to be the kind of children that God wants us to be. How do we do that? We always put God first in our lives. Matthew 6, 33. Matthew 10, 37 says, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And then we must put others before ourselves. Then, folks, and only then, can we stop many of the ills and the problems that we face in our world. We close this lesson this afternoon and we extend the Lord's invitation. If you're here as a child of God and you've wandered away, you're not living the Christian life as you should be living it, Maybe you've fallen from your duty not only to your family but to your spiritual family or to your Father in Heaven. Why not come back to God? Why not ask God to forgive you of whatever sin is in your life that may be publicly committed that is separated between you and God? Make those changes now and start serving God faithfully so that not only you can help your family but you can help other families But more importantly, you can help the family of God. Where all of us as a family can grow together and go to heaven together one day. If you're here and you're not a Christian, why not come to Jesus Christ through your obedience? Why not come in faith serving Him through that obedience to the Word? Why not come in repentance, changing your life, turning from sin, to obey God? Why not come confessing your faith in Him? Do you believe with all your heart Jesus is the Son of God? Then confess that. And upon the confession of your faith, be immersed in baptism, where you'll reach the blood of Jesus. You'll be saved from your sins. Your name will be enrolled and added to the Lamb's Book of Life. Then you serve God faithfully and live here to where heaven one day will be your home when this life is over. If you are subject in any way to the Lord's invitation, we urge you to come right now. Why together we stand and why we sing?